Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, welcome to another AMA. How are you doing? Doing, doing very well. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> you know, always happy to have you. What, I haven't talked to you yet today, so what kind of mood would you say you're in today? Oh, well, given the subject matter, surprisingly um, good mood. And, um, you know, I've taken a couple beta blockers before. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm riding the cool wave, man. That's good. I was curious if we were going to get diplomatic Peter or spicy Peter on this episode. I don't know, actually. <laughs> to be determined. To, yes, TBD. Perfect. So for today, we are covering a topic that, as you hinted at, is not one of your favorite, but we probably get asked the most amount of questions on in some form or another. It's a massive topic. It's nutrition. And we've done a ton of podcasts on this, ton of newsletters on this. And so we're not going to be able to cover everything as it relates to nutrition. But what we did is we pulled the most common questions, themes that we get asked, and we pulled them together for this episode. So we are going to talk about nutrition, its relationship in weight loss and weight management, how you think about it compared to exercise, like the complexities of nutrition research, which is why often when we send emails tearing apart studies, they are typically on nutrition, what you think of as quote unquote, the best diet, if we can even answer that, how that's different from a healthy person to someone who's trying to manage chronic disease, how people can think about choosing the best diet for themselves. Obviously we can't do nutrition without protein, which is one thing you do genuinely like to talk about. And we'll also hit some other hot button issues such as processed food. So without that, so with all that said, anything you want to add before we get rolling? No, let's jump into it. Perfect. Starting off, nutrition. Why do you hate talking about it? <laughs> well, look, it wasn't always this way. There was a day when I really enjoyed talking about nutrition and writing about nutrition. In fact, I, I sort of, uh, you know, you could argue I, I cut my teeth on that, right? That was my, my very first foray into doing anything publicly back in 2011 was blogging and it was blogging mostly about nutrition. Um, but I would say there are a handful of, of, of reasons that, that my, my interest in continuing to obsessively talk about it has, has sort of diminished. So, you know, you've alluded to some already. So the, the problem with nutrition, uh, research is that, um, it doesn't really lend itself to having uh, rigorous discussions on the topic. I read a really interesting and timely article the other day on LinkedIn, um, and it was titled something to the effect of food can't be medicine until we can research it like medicine. In fact, we should, we should link to that article in the show notes. Um, and it was, I mean, it was so spot on, right? It's like everyone loves to probably misquote Hippocrates with the let food be thy medicine line. Um, and yeah, it makes sense in a way. They're molecules. You put the molecules in, they clearly have an effect on your body. The problem is there's no relationship whatsoever between food and medicine. Um, the nature and the nature of which we can do controlled studies with medicine is completely different the homogeneity of medicine, right? If we're going to study a medication, um, you're getting the same molecule every time. And that's the one molecule that you're, you're studying, right? I mean, there are a few exceptions to that. If you're taking, for example, desiccated thyroid hormone, where you have kind of a hodgepodge of pig thyroid gland mixed up. Yeah. It might, you might have, you're, you're getting some T3, some T4, some T2, et cetera. But for the most part, when you take a drug, you're taking a single molecule. That's obviously not the case with food. Um, and then, so, so all of that notwithstanding, the real issue I have, because that's just, I think, a function of, of food, what, what sort of rubs me the wrong way is that the ratio of certainty with which people speak about this subject matter to the quality of data, so take that as a ratio. So on the top, you have certainty. On the bottom, you have quality of data. Um, you, you know, that is really, really low. Um, 
pardon me, really, really high. That's a really big number, meaning there's people have tons of certainty despite a paucity of data um, or quality of data. You don't have a paucity of data, you have a paucity of quality data. Um, and I've never seen, I've just, there's nothing that compares to this, right? So like there is no discipline of science or engineering for which our magnitude of certainty is so high relative to such poor quality data. Um, and then I think the final point I would make of many, but I don't want to spend the whole time on this, is that the zealous extremes and the cultish religious buffoonery that goes on in this space is just very off-putting to me. Um, and um, so, so whether we're talking about one end of the spectrum of carnivore to vegan, when people speak about their diet as the one true diet, uh, I find it very off-putting, which is not to say that a person who's vegan is off-putting. I mean, I've met many people who say, look, this is kind of the thing that works for me and, or this is my belief system. I just can't bring myself to eat animals. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What I'm saying, what I'm talking about is sort of the, the really cultish people who will tell you with absolute certainty that if you are eating anything other than this diet and this diet can be any diet, um, that, you know, you're going to go to hell basically like, there, you know, there's a, there's a warm place in Hades that's waiting for you. And of course they're not saying that, but the point is they're, they're speaking with such conviction about something for which such conviction is impossible. What do you think caused you to make a switch on nutrition, right? So you kind of hinted at, you kind of cut your teeth on this subject. When we met 12 or so years ago, you were deep in this subject. Was it a slow progression or do you think it was like, a more of a quick switch. No, I think it was pretty gradual. I don't, there wasn't like, there's not a moment I'll point to that says when that happened or when I read that one study or meta analysis or article, I had a change. It was, I, I think it was in part maybe as my clinical experience grew and I saw more and more patients and realized more and more the complexity of nutrition um, and the heterogeneity of people's response to different nutrition. In other words, how 10 people could respond in six different ways to, to, to given nutritional inputs that you start to realize, um, well, a couple things are true, right? One is that the, the, the body is remarkably adept at um, sort of dampening the effects of nutrition, right? So it's like, um, you know, if you think of an engineering system, there are some systems where when you put a signal in to the box, the box amplifies the signal. So you, you put something in that's a two out of 10 and it, it amplifies it to like an eight out of 10, right? Um, and sometimes you want that. Sometimes you need a signal amplifier. Um, but then you have the opposite is true, right? Where you put something in and it dampens the signal. So you put something in that's like a blinking eight out of 10 and the, the thing gets attenuated. It gets dampened. It comes out at a two out of 10. And in many ways, the body is that way with nutrition. And so a lot of the things that people pontificate about on the margins, um, end up being really not that important. And, and I've talked about this a bunch and maybe we'll even speak about it a, a little later today, but this, you know, once you get beyond, beyond total energy consumption, uh, or total energy content of the food, total calories, protein content, and the essentials within, uh, minerals and nutrients, most of the rest doesn't matter that much. The body's pretty resilient. You have to hit certain minimums on fat, um, to, to avoid severe malnutrition and, and sort of problems that occur there. Um, carbohydrate tolerance is staggeringly variable, right? You can get away without eating any carbs and still function, and you can get away with eating a ton of carbs and still function. Uh, and so, so that's actually kind of amazing is our variability on that one particular macronutrient. But beyond those big principles, there's very little that can be said with high certainty. Um, and one might even ask the question, how much really, really matters? I mean, we're now talking about fourth and fifth order terms on a polynomial here. Um, and those don't tend to really sway the outcome because um, the first, second, and third order terms are really clearly set. And so I think the next follow-up question would be, what measures of health, if any, that relate to nutrition can an individual monitor on their own to kind of understand, you know, 
where they're at health wise? Well, I think there are many, right? So obviously nutrition plays a huge role in anthropometric data. Um, so, you know, using a DEXA scan, which will tell you how much lean mass you have, how much body fat you have, and if the scan is calibrated correctly, at least give you a good estimate of how much visceral fat you have. Um, that's a great um, readout of nutrition. Uh, you could go even detailed in that and, and, and actually do scans of the liver specifically to look for liver fat. Also, a fantastic readout of nutrition uh, quite specifically. Um, you could look at biomarkers that uh, pertain to metabolic health and specifically to glucose regulation or glucose homeostasis. So if you look at either impaired or, um, uh, you know, enhanced glucose disposal uh, and other markers of, of, of metabolic health, this is everything that would range from how your CGM performs, your hemoglobin A1C, um, things like uric acid, things like uh, liver function tests, uh, your oral glucose tolerance test, all of those things are going to be very important readout states of nutrition. Now, of course, um, you know, the, those, those markers are also readout states of other things. They reflect your sleep and exercise quite a bit as well. Uh, but there's no doubt that those are reflections of your nutritional status. Um, in some cases, we would say otherwise unexplained inflammation could, could probably be driven by nutrition. Um, we certainly see that outside of very extreme examples, where, uh, you know, for example, celiac disease is a pretty extreme and specific case, but even absent something like celiac disease, there's clearly an intolerance to wheat on the part of many people. And it only shows up in uh, a biochemical assay that, that surveys for, for uh, inflammation, such as a, a C-reactive protein um, or a slight change in the white blood cell count or things of that nature. And, and, and we know this because when we do kind of the you know, empirical, you know, elimination, selective elimination and reintroduction of these things, we'll see those inflammatory markers move. So uh, there's no question that food plays a role in, in that as well. Um, and then obviously we can measure uh, certain deficiencies and or excesses uh, in, in the blood most commonly, but also in the urine or even in the hair. So in other words, you could, you could give you an example, right? You could see a person who is you know, B12 deficient. That's a very common finding in people who don't eat meat. Uh, and similarly, you can see an excess of mercury, which would be considered quite toxic if it gets to a high enough level for someone who, for example, is eating a lot of seafood and especially seafood that is uh, coming from really large fish who are high enough on the food chain that they're eating a lot of other fish and accumulating mercury themselves. So I would say like probably those would be the big four categories of things where nutrition is, is easy to read out in, in testing. And one of the questions we see come through a lot is kind of the relationship or the difference between nutrition and exercise as it relates to weight loss, weight maintenance, or gaining weight. What do we know about kind of those two things, nutrition and exercise, as it relates to weight? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a premium member. It's extremely important to me to provide all of this content without relying on paid ads. To do this, our work is made entirely possible by our members. And in return, we offer exclusive member only content and benefits above and beyond what is available for free. So if you want to take your knowledge of this space to the next level, it's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Premium membership includes several benefits. First, comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing that we discuss in each episode. And the word on the street is nobody's show notes rival ours. Second, monthly Ask Me Anything or AMA episodes. These episodes are comprised of detailed responses to subscriber questions, typically focused on a single topic and are designed to offer a great deal of clarity and detail on topics of special interest to our members. You'll also get access to the show notes for these episodes, of course. Third, delivery of our premium newsletter, which is put together by our dedicated team of research analysts. This newsletter covers a wide range of topics related to longevity and provides much more detail than our free weekly newsletter. Fourth, access to our private podcast feed that provides you with access to every episode, including AMAs, sans the spiel you're listening to now, and in your regular podcast feed. 
Fifth, the Qualies, an additional member-only podcast we put together that serves as a highlight reel featuring the best excerpts from previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and listen to each one of them. And finally, other benefits that are added along the way. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can also find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, all with the handle peteratiamd. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you use. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take all conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of all disclosures. Mm-hmm.